whether you're new to prepping or have been prepping for years, these are mistakes that could easily derail you from accomplishing your goals when getting ready for unseen events. We're going to run through the top 10 common mistakes people make when getting into prepping. So to begin, number one, failure to identify the most likely risk in prepping for those first. This is intentionally number one on my list as it often dictates the direction your prepping will go. For example, living in Southern California, earthquakes are fairly routine. Now, if I lived in the Gulf of Mexico, there's a high probability I'll face hurricanes eventually. And if I lived in Oklahoma, I can expect tornadoes will eventually visit my area. You see a common thread? When starting in prepping, or even those that have been prepping for years, first focus on what the most probable threat is in your region. It's easy to start prepping for things that are highly improbable, but possible, like an EMP blast, when much higher probable threats are a reality. It's much easier, if you're like me, to focus on getting gadgets and cool gear, which we'll talk about later, for bugging out as opposed to focusing on obtaining the important things, stocking up food, water, medical supplies, developing skills. You know, the boring things. So get to know your region. Learn the challenges your region faces and focus on preparing for those things first. And beyond preparing for natural occurring catastrophes in your area, consider the reality of everyday things that can come up, like losing your job, Prepping's not all about preparing for improbable scenarios like a Yellowstone volcano eruption or a complete breakdown in society, but rather preparing for situations that are far more likely to come up. With a little foresight, you can avoid a major catastrophe for scenarios that are more probable. Number two, a lack of discipline and organization. Maybe just as important as number one is the ability to be organized and disciplined. And yes, I put two skills into one point, but these go hand in hand, which we'll talk about. Number one, discipline. Before you start down the path of prepping, it's easy to lose focus or get sidetracked by trivial issues. You'll need the ability to stay focused on what needs to be done. Motivation will get you excited enough to get started far before you get burnt out. But discipline forces you to focus on what is important and enables you to push distractions out of the path to achieving your goals. In this case, getting prepared. What has helped me a great deal is to set aside a realistic amount of time each day. Typically, I try to dedicate about 15 to 30 minutes each day to learn something new, to develop a skill. In addition to time, the reality is that this lifestyle will require money. In our household, we have a budget, and I set aside a certain amount of money each month to buy the supplies that we need. At the moment, we are expanding our long-term food and water storage in our house. And it's easy to look at the mountain of requirements you'll read about when getting into prepping, but if you can discipline yourself by starting with a small, realistic goal you can move forward step by step in the process. Along with discipline is organization. Discipline, sister, organization is very important. Without organization, you'll be scattered and ineffective. You'll be collecting gear and resource to help you survive a catastrophe, but if not properly stored and rotated, these items will be rendered useless when you need them most. If you've stocked up on food and water storage and then simply toss them in the back of the closet, You'll likely find out that in a few years when you need them, that they'll either spoil, they're no longer fit for use. So in this scenario, you could have properly rotated your supplies to prevent them from spoiling. Now, I'm not suggesting you become obsessive about your assets fixing on them every day. But with a few simple calendar reminders, you can set aside 10 minutes once every month to review your gear and to make sure everything is where it needs to be and that your food and water inventories are well within their dates of expiration. Side note. When doing long-term food and water storage, be sure to label them. I have five-gallon water containers in my closets, and I have dates written on the side of all of the containers to tell me when I filled them up, including the expiration date. Number three, spending your entire budget on gear instead of food, water, and medical supplies. On this one, I'll be honest, I am guilty as charged. This is definitely my biggest weakness. I love, love, love gear. I'm a big gadgets guy. I get a rush from purchasing that new K-Bar knife or that two-way ham radio or getting that high-end rifle optic. Now, I'm just being honest here with you. But storing food, water, and medical supplies, it's just not something I really get excited about. I don't get that same feeling as I get when I buy a new gadget when I have to, you know, prepare to store beans and rice in a closet in Mylar bags. It just doesn't give me that same emotional rush. But if your community was hit by disaster, are you going to be able to feed your family on that new really cool 511 Rush 72 hour bug out bag. Can you eat those 2000 rounds of ammunition that you put in the back of your closet? As pointed out in the first point, focus first on what is most important and probable. While we enjoy new gadgets and gear, 
These are not the most important things to have in your preps. They come in time, but they should never be the focal point when you begin to get into preps. And, and even for those that have been in prepping for a long time, the foundations of food, water, and medical supplies, though those will always be the most important. Number four, food and water storage deficiency. As I just talked about in the previous point, getting long-term food and water storage prepared is critical, but it's often pushed down the list of priorities. Ever read the articles of communities like Los Angeles after an earthquake hit, or even if you've been paying attention to what's happening in Venezuela right now, people will make a run on food and water supplies when things go bad. Be sure to build this foundation strong before moving on in your preps. While we're talking about water, I personally live in Southern California. Water is very scarce where I live, and so when I first started prepping, getting a three-day supply of water for myself and my family, it was a first-order business. If a disaster strikes here, earthquakes are our biggest threats, obviously, the infrastructure would likely be damaged, and municipal water services will be offline. Do you know what to do if you turn on your water faucet and nothing came out? So expanding our water storage is something we personally work on a lot. Maybe you live in an area where water is not scarce, but having the ability to contain or purify that water is as extremely as important as well. The general rule of thumb is to store one gallon of water per person per day, and that is a very conservative number at best. The second point in line with food and water is obviously food. Having a backup inventory of food you already use on a daily basis is a first step for food storage. In our household, we follow this approach when preparing food storage. And I'll just run through these three really quickly. Number one, we create a three-day food backup of foods that can be eaten without uh, cooking being required. These are mostly canned food that we can rotate and easily throw into a box if we had to head out quickly. Number two, create a month backup supply of food we already use. We store these additional foods in a cool, dark place in our house where we pull from the inventory when we, when we need to use the food for meals we're already eating. When we pull something, we have a clipboard in our closet where we can write down what was removed, and on future shopping trips, we simply replace these items. Now, using this approach, we can easily build a month or two back up to existing food we already eat. Number three, long-term food storage. Beyond the one to two month backup supply, we have a long-term food storage that can last up to 20 to 25 years. Now, these are items that we've meticulously stored in food canisters, these are there to ensure that we have a long-term food backup plan in place in the event that our region doesn't get back to normal within a month or two. Number five, preparing mostly to bug out rather than bugging in. The idea of heading for the hills and surviving in the wild with your good old trusty bug out bag really gets preppers excited for some reason. I guess in this community we spend so much time expecting the worst to happen, uh, the end of the world as we know it, that we'll fixate on heading out the door if something bad happens. While many people have experienced camping out or bushcraft skills, the stress of being forced out of your home living in a refugee-like situation means there's going to be big problems, and it's not going to really be a pleasurable time. And guess what? If others are being forced out as well, resources you thought would be available in the wilderness will be used up quickly. Imagine a large population being driven to the hills. Then when you are going to live off the land hunting and foraging food in your local national park, the reality is if you add a large group of people into the same area, people are just going to pick the resources clean very quickly. Now, unless I absolutely have to leave my home, I plan on to ride out whatever emergency is occurring as long as it's safe to stay in my house. Leaving my house is the absolute last option I would consider. But if I had to, I would leave. Now, within your home, you have a defensible space, you have gear and supplies, you know your territory, but heading out into the unknown adds a lot of variables to the equation very quickly. Also, remember that if you don't leave way ahead of the rest of the crowd trying to flee, you're going to be sitting in a lot of traffic with a solid possibility of going nowhere. In my area, we have a really dense population, and, and if an evacuation were to occur, there's going to be a lot of people going nowhere fast. By the time often that you realize that it is time to leave, Probably everybody else has figured that out too, and everybody's going to be jamming into the highways. I'm not sure, but if you remember when the hurricane hit Houston, Texas back in 2005, everyone realized they needed to get out because Katrina had just happened before, so everybody was freaking out, and everybody headed out on the freeway at the same time. And what ended up happening is a mass gridlock where people had to abandon their cars. They ran out of gas. Uh, it just wasn't a good situation. Number six, having the right gear but not knowing how to use it. Tools are really great to have. But if you don't know how to use them, they're useless. How many people in there desire to learn how to become a prepper of obtained gear but never learned how to use it? A few years back, I purchased a firearm. 
And I took it to the range and I fired a few rounds off. Now, I have a background in basic firearm safety, but I had no experience with that type of firearm I had just purchased. While I was confident I understood the basics of how to operate this weapon, that was about the extent of my ability with this newly purchased rifle. A few months later, I had the opportunity to take a three-day training course through a company that specializes in training novices like myself. After three days of one-on-one -on -one intensive training, 800 rounds of 9mm and 1800 rounds of 5.56, let's just say I had the hang of my newly purchased rifle and pistol. I'm now confident dealing with gun jams, handling magazine reloads quickly, and transitioning in between two weapons systems quickly. Through studying under professionals, I was able to become proficient with the tool. Know your gear and use it. Practice with it. If you don't know how to use it, find someone that does or find a video on YouTube. I was able to quickly find prepper groups in my local area that taught me a great deal about food, water, and medical preps. I now not only have the right gear, but I know how to use it. Number seven, storing all your preps in the same place. Now, keeping things stored in different locations throughout your house and even in backup locations, for example, think about storage facility or other places, it gives you backup options. Part of your house may be damaged in an earthquake or hurricane or tornado, and or you may not even be able to access your home at all. Do you have food or water stored in your garage, for example? The garage is typically the weakest structure in your house, and if there's an event, it could easily, that part of your house could easily be damaged and you may not even be able to access your preps. Do you remember that phrase, don't store all your eggs in one basket? The meaning is simple. If you keep everything in one place, the odds of that prep being destroyed or stolen increases significantly. Diversify. Number eight, failure to build a network with other preppers. It's easier to stay yourself and not work with others as there's less risk of others knowing about your supplies. But in a situation in which catastrophe visits your area, having someone to help you could literally mean the difference between life and death. Don't assume you'll be able to do things on your own. Where you lack a skill, another person may have a skill you desperately need. Do you have military experience, medical skills, hunting abilities? If so, you're really a rarity. More likely than not, you may not have any of these skill sets. And having others around you that have strengths where you have weaknesses will help you stay alive. So. And vice versa, you may have a skill that could help someone that has a more advanced skill than you. So hopefully you've developed a skill you can bring to the table if your community is hit by a disaster. Find a talent you can develop. Number nine, buying stuff while ignoring the need to develop skills. As I just mentioned, I love getting gadgets, but imagine if an earthquake hit my area and there's no running water and the grocery store has been picked clean. That new thing that I just purchased, it's going to be an asset to me. But if I didn't develop some basic skills those gadgets and those tools, they're not going to be very helpful in the long run. Now, here's a simple list of things you can begin to do and learn to help improve your chances of survival. These are skills that you can pick up, and most of them really cost you nothing to develop. Number one, find water sources in your area and learn how to purify water. Number two, learn how to start and maintain a fire. Number three, get in shape. Number four, self-defense. Number five, land navigation, using a compass and map. Number six, building a shelter. Number seven, first aid. Number eight, trapping and fishing. Number nine, plant identification. And number 10, gardening. Those are 10 skills. I don't have all of them yet, but I am in the process of developing many of them and will be always working and thinking down the road how I can develop each one of those. And I would encourage you to do the same. Now, it can be overwhelming to look at all this and say, oh my goodness, there's so much to learn. And this leads us into the next point, which is number 10, getting burnt out. This is a very common thing I see. People will get all fired up about prepping. They'll start snapping up gear and other items they feel they need. And after a while, they just get overwhelmed and eventually just burn out and they stop. Now, here's how I personally counter that from happening. I prioritize and budget, which we talked about earlier. For years, when I was getting my finances in order, I personally used a book by a financial writer by the name of Dave Ramsey. I'll provide a link to the book that I used in the description below. And when we use this material, it helped us to pay off debt and to get our finances in order and to create a budget. In the book, he lays out seven easy steps to follow. For me personally, I like to know I can do things in bite-sized chunks that are obtainable and doable. Our household has followed his plan and it has put us in a great place financially. With prepping, it's important to understand this is a marathon and not a sprint. I've met many preppers who sprint fast and then get burnout quickly. 
In our monthly budget, we set aside a certain amount of money for preps. If you had a list of priorities for things you need to purchase and prepare, I personally always preach these four. Number one is water, number two is food, number three is medical supplies, and number four is safety. Pace yourself. You don't have to get everything in order right away, but if you commit yourself to the long haul and take little steps each month, in time you'll be in a great position. As always, I hope you found this video useful. And if you enjoy our content, please feel free to subscribe to our channel and like the video. And as always, I enjoy your comments. I always learn a lot from the community when people provide comments and feedback. So please feel free to drop a line below. As always, be safe out there. Thank you.